Children's Church, the announcement you've been waiting for. You are dismissed. How are you? I'm a little strong. I'm a little strong. So, you glad you woke up this morning. You gl- Not very convincing. Glad you're a Christian. Tell you what, when you decided to follow Christ, you made an intelligent and logical decision that will pay benefits in the long run, but also pays great benefits in the here and now. Because Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it to the fullest. So, eternal life is something that begins right now as we follow Christ, but it will pay huge dividends in the age to come when you're in God's kingdom. So, if you're not a part of God's kingdom, God's family, if you've never made Christ the Lord of your life, we're going to give you the opportunity to do that at the end of the sermon. So, if you want to do that, we're here for you. The water is 92 degrees, it's ready. Uh, Jesus called, every person Jesus called, he called publicly to confess our faith in him as the divine son of God and put our hearts and lives in surrendership and under his beautiful control. So that's what we'll do at the end of the message. We stand, we sing, and that's the opportunity to say, I want to become a follower of Christ. Today's message is the first one in this series called Celebrate Him. And if you're here this morning and you don't know what's going on about Christianity, you've, you know, I have no idea, you know, if you want to have some idea about what all, the, what all the hubbub is about this time of year and why Christians just get wild and frenet, you know, frantic and fanatic about this guy called Jesus, uh, I hope this sermon will be able to answer some of your questions. And if you're here and you're a follower of Christ, I want this sermon to be able to affirm you in your faith and help you to continue on with diligence and energy for the life that you've chosen in followership of Christ. So today's sermon is called The Only Expected Person. Would you stand with me as I take a brief look at this one scripture? There's some others in the past in the message, but this one. And all this took place. To fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Father in heaven, I pray your blessing on the preaching of the word this morning. I pray, Father, that you would help each one of us to hear the voice of your Holy Spirit nudging us and calling us to a deeper commitment to Christ, who we honor and lift up his holy name. Father, I pray that something I say today or what I say today will honor the Christ child and be able to help each of us to just have a firmer and more joyful belief in him. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So next weekend, as you heard the lady say, is our drive-through nativity, and it's something that we do once a year. We took about a five or six year hiatus, but we're back, and we're doing it better than ever, and we're really excited about the opportunity to do it. And what it is, if you've never been through it, you drive through, and it tells the story. We tell the story of the events that took place at the birth of Jesus. So if you haven't handed out cards, here's what we're going to do next year. I thought about this. I didn't think about this in time. So next year, we're going to have a contest of who can hand out the most cards. We have these little postcards, okay? I've given some at my gym where I go. I gave them a pile, and I went to the bank. And, and uh, in fact, I got to go to the doctor down the street and give him some. And uh, so we're going to, you know, but next year, we're just going to have like a thermometer. See if we can, see if we can give out 10,000 cards next year, Okay. And we got to get after this thing. This is a low budget operation, so it's a people to people thing, all right? So we got to get after it. So that's what we're going to do next year. We're just going to see who can, I don't know, we may, I don't know what we'll give as a prize. Maybe nothing, but nevertheless, 
we may just celebrate ourselves as a church. So we did that. We did it, you know, with fireworks and whatnot. But so next year is what we're going to do. But this year, you got to talk to your neighbors. You got to talk to your friends. You got to talk to those that don't talk to you normally. And you got to bring them out and make them a part of this. I got people that are coming and never come to church, but are going to come to the drive through and we want to be able to, you know, expand our influence, tell the story about Jesus, the real story about Jesus. So, yeah, so we're going to be doing that. So if you're not involved, get involved, and, and uh, if you're not coming, come, and if you're not bringing anybody, make sure you bring somebody. So, all right, let's stop and think about it. The birth of Christ. Now stop and think about it. What was it about the birth of Jesus that caused so much wonder? I mean, crazy things were happening. Angels were appearing from another dimension into our world and announced to some shepherds that the Messiah, the long-expected one, had been born in a small village, in an out-of-the-way place, in an out-of-the-way part of the world called Bethlehem. Stars were not where they were supposed to be. At least one star. This is, this is unprecedented. Ain't Herod, Herod, the great ruler of that part of the world, was very squeamish and insecure about the birth of the Christ child. And wise men had traveled from far away to come and worship this child who was born and to bring expensive gifts to him. I mean, you cannot help but think, something was up. And think about all the the songs that had been written about the birth of Jesus through the years. And they all help underscore something about the amazement and the wonder at what was taking place in the bringing of this person into the world. And yet he came in just like you and I. Babies, all babies are miracles. You ever looked at a baby's face when they're first born? It's absolutely, if there's, to look at a child when they're first born and see that miracle. Of, there's no rational person that could believe in evolution. No rational person could believe in such nonsense. Just looking at the face of a child. And we haven't even begun to talk, and that's a whole other subject. But all babies are miracles. But what makes, what makes this baby unique? That all the hubbub, all the love, and all the hatred, and all the energy that's gone into the birth of Christ. Oh, they knew knew something was a stir. They knew something you could sense. There was change in the air. There was something wonderful and powerful taking place. There was, there was, you can tell there was movement. There was, this was, this was a child not like any other child. This was a night not like any other night. There was amazement taking place, not only in the heavens, but now also on the earth. So I want to ask the fundamental question, why? What was it that made Jesus' birth unique? Why all the hubbub? Why 2,000 years later does the world stop for a moment and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? At least most of the world does. Why? What was it about that birth that made it unique? I want to answer that question. And the first thing we see is the fact that the the birth of Jesus, Jesus coming into our world, was prophesied. Now, most of us are surprises. Were you a surprise? I was a surprise. My siblings were a surprise. My children were a surprise. All right? Most of us were surprises, and we won't go into any more detail on that. You know what I'm saying. But Jesus was not 
a surprise. He was the only expected person. He had been prophesied about hundreds of years in advance. The people of Israel had been waiting for a Messiah for a long time. And then suddenly, a birth announcement came on a hill to a bunch of shepherds in the middle of the night, a birth announcement from angels saying, hey boys, he's here. The one you have been anticipating is here. Luke chapter 2 mentions this. And the angels said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now I want to go through just a few of the prophecies that were made about Jesus. And you can do run the numbers, the mathematicians have run the numbers on this, and the chances of this being accidental or circumstantial is just, I don't have that many zeros. It just is it's impossible, okay, on a, on a virtually impossible. But let's take a look. He was, the book of Genesis says, he was born of the seed of Abraham. That was fulfilled. The book of Jeremiah said that he would be of the household of David. That was fulfilled. The book of Micah said that he would be born in Bethlehem. That was fulfilled. The psalmist said that he would receive presents. That was fulfilled. Micah said that he would be one who was pre-existing. That was fulfilled. Deuteronomy said that he would be a prophet. That was more than fulfilled. Psalms said that he would be a priest. Hebrew says he is our great high priest. That was fulfilled. Psalms 2.6 said he would be a king. He's the king of kings. That was fulfilled. But there's one scripture that stands out. I want to focus on Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6, and verses 10 through 11 for just a moment. Look at this. Check this out. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Check this out. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. That's the big deal about the birth of Jesus don't tell me he didn't exist. The, prophets were, the prophecies are undeniable evidence of the person of Jesus. Don't tell me he's not special. There's nobody that fulfilled all those prophecies. He's in a league all his own. And that Isaiah 53 passage that I just read was written 700 years before the birth of Christ. And you think, who, on earth, who else could that be talking about except Jesus of Nazareth? Don't tell me he's not special. He's unique. He's in a league all his own. Here's something else that makes his birth special. He was born of a virgin. Now that doesn't happen every day. Nothing normal about that. Absolutely unique. The Bible says by the Holy Spirit, Mary conceived and was with child. And by the way, Mary was a virgin at this point, but Mary wasn't a virgin her whole life. 
That's just, there's no evidence for that in the Bible. Now, there's church theologies that say that, but there's no evidence for that in the Bible. She had other children. Jesus had other brothers and sisters who came along later, and that's perfectly good and normal. But at this point in time, Mary was a virgin. It's prophesied about her in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, in some places, that word is used to describe a young woman. But it's without question, you should do a deep, deeper dig on it, that the only meaning of the word that can make any sense for us at all is that that word is, is, is translated as a virgin. She was a virgin when she conceived by the Holy Spirit. You see, to become human and save us, God had to bypass the normal process of conception. So Jesus, being a man, born of woman, did not come from man. Jesus repeatedly said that he, he was not of this world. That is, he came from above. And as one who was born of a virgin and who was born from above, Jesus had the capacity to sin, but he did not have the inclination to sin. The Bible says he was tempted in every way as we are. Tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. His virgin birth confirms his deity that he was from above. He was in essence God. He was man and God. He was totally unique, totally different, and totally, totally without precedent. The virgin birth is how deity and humanity could reside in one person. It's absolutely amazing. He wasn't just a guru or a prophet or a teacher or someone who was a wise scribe. He was God in the flesh. John chapter 1 states it very clearly for us. John chapter 1 states it very clearly for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Read that. Let's read that again. In the beginning was... Would you read it with me? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He's the most remarkable person. There's no one like Him. Words fail me in my ability to describe the majesty and power and uniqueness and character and wonder of this person named Jesus. And another reason we saw, so not only was he prophesied, he was born of a virgin, but there's something else going on, and that leads me to this. He brought God into our world. Our plight, check this out, our plight before we were saved. If you're a Christian, this was your plight before you became a Christian. If you're not yet a Christian, this is your destiny, unless you decide to do something about it. Let's take a look at this passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Therefore remember at that time, you, Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, in other words, we weren't Jews, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time, here we go, ready? This isn't good news. Well, it's a good news if it's past tense, but if it's present, it's not. at that time you were separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, I mean, not part of the people of God, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That's our plight. Yours and mine, outside of Christ. But the Bible says something happened. God moved. And He didn't leave us in this condition, and he took the initiative to try to call us back into a relationship with himself. And these scriptures, I got some good scriptures here for you. Matthew chapter 1, 22 is fantastic. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, 
the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I got another one here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This one's really good. Not that that one wasn't good. Well, they're all good, but this is really good too. 2 Corinthians 5. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. God was moving, bringing us back into reconciliation with himself through the person of Jesus who eventually died on the cross on our behalf. And then this one, this one's really fantastic. Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Born of a woman, born under law, that he might buy us back and may take us to himself. And this one here, oh, this one's really good too. 1 Timothy 2. This is good. I told you it was good. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people, all people, to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. In the late 1800s, there was a preacher named Phillips Brooks who went to the Holy Land. And he went to the, he was on a hill outside the village of Bethlehem. And as he looked down on the village of Bethlehem, this was in the days before Edison did his thing with a light bulb. As he looked down on the village of Bethlehem, he could not help but notice how dark it was over that little village. And seeing that gives us an appreciation for the statement in Scripture where it says, Behold, they have seen a great light. A light in the Bible is a euphemism for the knowledge of God. Behold, they have seen a great light. Now some people want to reduce... Christmas to a holiday and some people want to reduce Christianity to simply a, you know, another religion or something that neur neurotic people do who don't have anything else to do. And sociologically, Christianity is lumped in with all the other religions, but that's a surface observation of things because when you stop and think about it, Christianity is not a religion. Religion is man's search for God. Hmm? We're going to figure this thing out. We're going to find out who God is. We're going to, you know, get in contact with, you know, the great spirit or something like that. Religion is man's search for God. Christianity is God's search for man. And no one, you or me, no one will go to heaven because we've achieved some degree of moral superiority to somebody else. In reality, heaven came to us in the person of Jesus and calls us home to come back to him. This week, we get to tell that story. This week, we get to tell the story about the Christ child who came to bring God into our world so that he might bring our world back to God. Irenaeus said it so well so many, many, many centuries ago. He said, Christ in his infinite mercy became all that we are in order that he might make us into all that he is. We get a chance this week to tell that story. 
Before we do that, and so that, that, I just want to encourage you, if you're not in, get in. This is our chance to go beyond. This is our chance to do something, to do something, to make a difference in people's lives. And I hope that you're participating in that. And I want to take a few moments to pray for the event this week. It just, this, that just dovetail with this sermon and so well, and I just want to take the opportunity for us to, to pray for the event this week. Father in heaven, we can put our best foot forward. We can have all these efforts that we want to do and things that we want to do for you. But we realize that apart from you, we can do nothing. Jesus said that he's the vine and we're the branches, and apart from him, we can do nothing. And so we're doing what we can, Lord. But we ask you to oversee the whole process, that you would bring glory and honor to your name, that you would draw people who may not have a clue about who Jesus is, but would stop at least for a moment this week and begin to think and consider who this guy was. So would you be with our shepherds, our our innkeepers, our townspeople, our marketplace people, our planners, our leaders, our donkeys and sheep. Would you be with every aspect, Lord, of what we're doing? And we pray that you would give glory and honor back to yourself. We just entrust it to you to do your good work. And I ask and I bring this to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So, praise team, if you'll come on up. We're going to sing a song of decision. It's an opportunity, as I said before, for you to make a personal commitment to Jesus. And if you've never done that, or if you say, I don't know what this is about, but I want to talk to somebody about this, come talk to me. Let me help you. Let me help. I, I think I can help you and answer some of your questions and help you come to a relationship with him. So let's stand and sing. Jesus. 
be seated. We have something really special today. That's why I wore my American jacket. Mm -hmm. Um, you guys can be seated, right? Okay. <laughs> Doug, you're gonna. Yeah. Are you gonna pay it? Well. This represents 20 years almost to the day that Mike and Jeanette Edwards became man and wife. So would you guys come on up? Um, it was 20 years ago. What was the date? December 1st. December 1st. 20 years ago. Wow. We were all younger then. Yes, we were. And there you go. And we were all younger then, and it was a great day. <laughs> I said that once, didn't I? So I want to tell you as we, as we come into the do these vows again, how... Um, just how proud I am to know both of you. And not only to, to be able to do this the first time, but to do it a second time. And I'm proud of you and your growth in the Lord and your love for one another. You've raised a son. He's a godly, brilliant young man. And uh, you have much to be proud of. And so we've watched you and encouraged you and and receive the same from you guys, and we just, uh, we're all proud to see this. You have some family members here. How many of you were uh, family members? You kind of raise your hand, okay. How many of you were present the first time? All right, and I know some of the young ones, they weren't here the first time, okay. All right, so some of you here the first, well, if you weren't here the first, so most of them were here the first time. Yeah, all right. Mike, you wanted to say something to your bride or to the audience? Either? Yes, yes. First, I want to say thank you to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the foundation for which we have built our relationship as husbands and wife. I also want to thank you for being an awesome wife, a partner, a friend in this journey. I also want to thank you for being a great mom to our son, Jordan. To all of our struggles, we we'll always rely on Christ to take us through everything we've been through and rejoice because of him. And this day is a joyful day I will cherish forever. I will forever love you and cherish you in all that you do and all that I do. I thank God, our Father, for the opportunity, Lord, to be married once again to you. I love you. Thank you. All right. You ready for the vows? Yes. Okay. Mike? If you'll speak into the microphone to your to your wife. Yes. <laughs> Mike, you take this woman whose hand you now hold to be your wife. Will you love her, honor her, comfort her, and keep her? And forsaking all others, be faithful to her as long as you both shall live. I do. Would you repeat after me? I Mike. I Mike. Take you, Jeanette. Take you, Jeanette. To be my wife. To be my wife. Again. Again. <laughs> I put that in there. <laughs> to have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better or for worse. For better or for worse. For richer or for poorer. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. Okay, Jeanette, your turn. Jeanette, do you take this man whose hand you now hold to be your husband? Will you love him, honor him, comfort him, and keep him, and forsaking all others, be faithful to him 
as long as you both shall live. I do. Repeat after me. I, Jeanette. I, Jeanette. Take you, Mike. Take you, Mike. To be my husband. To be my husband. Again. Again. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better or for worse. For better or for worse. For richer or for poorer. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. And God's people said. Amen. By the way, those are the same vows. Because I didn't change them. <laughs> except for the very, very end, I changed the wording just a little bit. That I've done through the years. Those are the same vows that you spoke to one another. 20 years ago, the very same ones. So that's pretty cool. So this is the part of the, sermon, of the wedding where we call the charge. And where I just have people and encourage them and remind them about some things that are really important. I don't need to remind you about those things. You're already doing them. Faithfulness, fidelity, commitment, love, thoughtfulness, selflessness, uh, giving and taking, being there for one another, loving one another, building each other up, praying together. You're already doing all the things that I would tell you to do. So all I can just say is continue to do what you're doing and continue to grow in your love for the Lord and in your love for each other. For as much as you have consented together again in holy wedlock, and I've witnessed the same before God and this company. It does me a great deal of honor as your pastor and your friend to pronounce the ongoing rela relationship and marriage of Mike and Jeanette Edwards. May God has joined together. May no man ever tear apart. And God's people said, Amen. let's pray for them. Father, I thank you for this beautiful moment where this wonderful couple has come together in the sight of Jesus, their friends, and their church to renew their love for one another. I pray, Father, that you would continue to watch over them, bless them, grant them good health, grant them longevity, grant them wisdom and direction for the days and years ahead. And I thank you, Lord, for their wonderful example of a Christian couple to the rest of us. Again, I, I pray your richest blessings on them. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I forgot. I'm sorry, buddy. It's all right. It's all right. Leave it to a man to bring that up, right? <laughs> yes, you may kiss your bride. Okay. We're going to have a reception in the fellowship hall for them. If you want to stay for a few minutes and just say a word of congratulations and a good word to them, I know they would appreciate it. There's some, some nice stuff out there. Jeff, wherever he is, Jeff did an outstanding job, outstanding job getting that room ready. It's really nice, and so I think it's very fitting for what you guys are doing today. So uh, let's, let's stand for closing prayer, and we can go. Father, it's good to be a Christian. It's good to be a part of your household, part of your family, part of your kingdom. I thank you, Lord, for Mike and Jeanette, the, the great words that they have shared with each other again as an inspiration to the rest of us. I thank you for Jesus who came into our world that he might bring us into his. And I pray, Father, that you would go before us this week, help us to share a good word about Christ to other people, that they might have what we have. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Hope to see you next door for just a couple minutes. I, I should have had you guys come back up. Oh, well.